All right, so here is the last video in the stream. Sorry this took so long. Um, but yeah, basically, as you probably know if you've been watching since the first one, uh, the stream from Twitch got cut off somehow on each of the three videos. I did one, I did three of them, um, and the last parts just all got cut off for whatever reason. Probably has to do with my bitrate. Whatever, let's move forward. Kinematics, let's talk about that. So kinematics is basically study of motion um, with um, physics. So how does something move? So let's say for um, position and distance. So position, I'm going to um, color code red and in distance, I'm going to color code blue. So let's just say you have two points start point and an end point and then you have a thing just like going around like maybe something like that <coughs> and then let's pretty much look at this so actually i'm going to do that in blue you'll see why okay so the blue, that actually represents the distance traveled. So that should be a pretty not too foreign concept to us, right? And I'm going to have a red line here. That represents the displacement or position. That just means how far is the point away from the initial point. So you just draw a straight line between them. You get the displacement or position. So displacement and position are denoted usually with x of t or s of t. Um, that's just a standard one. You don't necessarily have to use that all the time. It's just like, you know how f of x is the thing that usually represents function, but you don't have to use f of x. It's just people tend to do that. So some of you have taken um, enough calculus to know what integrals are. Some of you right now haven't. So if you haven't, don't worry about this part. But um, with integral calculus, you can say that s of t is actually the integral of velocity, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I'll explain exactly why this works, but that is going to be distance. So velocity is normally v of t. That just tells you how fast something is moving and, and in what direction. So it could be negative or positive. Speed just tells you how fast something is going. So because of that, um, absolute value of v of t is going to be speed. So it doesn't take into account negative or positive, it just is. And that's what the concept of absolute value is anyway. All right, so with derivatives, we can understand uh, velocity as the rate of change of position. So how fast is this white dot moving over time, essentially? So when we look at it that way, then we can say that v of t is just s prime. So if s is measured in like, let's say miles and time is measured in hours, then v of t, that'll be miles over hours, miles per hour, right? So that makes perfect sense. I get miles over hours because um, velocity, um, well, derivatives are a difference quotient. So you get a quotient from that difference. Anyway, moving on. Integral calculus tells us that v of t is the abs the um, integral of a of t dt. So let's talk about this absolute value thing and how it relates up there. So the area under the absolute value function for this is going to give you all positives, right? So the over here, when we look at this blue curve, we see that the particle moves in, let's just say that's positive, then negative, then positive, then negative again. So if we look at displacement, it'll the negatives will basically cancel out. But if we look at distance, then all the negatives have to be turned to positive. And then if you integrate that, then you will get your total distance. All right, now acceleration, usually A of T because acceleration A. And that's just the rate of change of velocity or the rate of change of the rate of change of position. So V prime or S double prime. 
So now let's apply this to some stuff and use calculus to do things. Okay, so height, this function, that's your position. So if we want to find v of t, we can just take the derivative of that. So that's negative 32t plus 64. You can factor out a negative 32 and get t minus 2. I would say to always do this no matter what, because usually if you're given a problem like this, it's probably going to be a pretty quick um, factoring thing. And if you need to do something like um, curve sketching, like finding the min or max points or whatever, then that's easy with this. You can find it. And then a of t takes the derivative of that, negative 32. So if you've taken physics, this thing should look familiar. g, acceleration due to gravity is negative 32 feet per second squared, right? Or in metric, 9.81 meters per second squared. All right, so just make that connection there. That just happens to be there. So if you were to find the max, you can actually easily find it here with that. So at t equals 2, you got a max, just saying. Um, you can curve sketching that if you want to check that. All right, so how fast is the ball moving at t equals 10? So how fast is it moving? We can use the velocity function. And then we get negative 32 times 10 plus 64, which equals negative uh, 256 meters per uh, feet per second, because that's that. Feet per second. Um, however, it is asking how fast the ball is moving. So what if it were asking for speed instead? If we're asking for speed, then all you have to do is absolute value this whole thing, right? So it's just 256 feet per second. So I didn't specify that there, but I'm just kind of having that quick little conversation here about it. All right, so now let's look at this. This is where we can apply some interesting stuff, specifically integrals and the fundamental theorem of calculus. So you're given this initial condition, you want to find that, and you're given velocity. So S is um, the antiderivative of velocity, right? So in other words, the integral from 0 to 5 of velocity is going to be is antiderivative at the end and beginning of the interval. So if we wanted s of 5 alone, we can just take this thing over to the other side. So let's do that. And we get this. So just substitute things in. That's 10. I'm going to do minus 32 TDT. Ten minus okay, thirty-two t squared over two. That'll be minus sixteen t squared. Evaluate from zero to five. Substitute things in, and we get ten minus four hundred equals negative three ninety. Uh, let's just say that's meters. By the way, this is like my third or fourth time recording this part because things got weird, and like cut off and stuff, and not working. So. That's why I was able to do that calculation in my head really fast. All right, anyway, moving on. Differential equations. So let's talk about what a differential equation is in the first place and then kind of talk about how to work with them. So a differential equation is an equation that gives you information just based on what's called the differential or um, derivatives. So we know things about the slopes and then Essentially, we can find things out based on that. So imagine kind of like a river or like, let's say we have a little pond here and then there's like different currents going on. I'm gonna represent them by arrows. Like maybe there's a fountain in the middle and 
some things are just moving in different directions. Let's say you put like a leaf in here. What's going to happen is it's going to be pushed out and then kind of start going along this trajectory. And yeah, if you put a leaf over here, it'll start going. It looks like it's getting pushed toward there and probably just going to travel along a different path. So that's essentially what a differential equation is. It gives you information about this thing and has you get an initial condition and then uh, draw curves based on that. So let's just do that here and draw the slope field itself so we can see what our pond-ish thing is going to be doing. So easiest way is to get the zeros first. X equals zero, that's going to be this line, right? So if X equals zero, then everything is going to be zero. So that's convenient. If Y equals zero, same thing, right? Okay, how about if X equals one? Then the slope is going to be whatever Y is. And then if we move over to x equals 2, slope is going to be twice of whatever y is. So let's take all of these and multiply them by 2. So here we're going to have a slope of 2 and then a slope of 4, which is going to be like really steep. And then slope of negative 2, slope of negative 4. Okay, so notice that if you actually do this on the other side, um, I'm just going to do this partly for um, pattern sake and time and I'm going to actually flip those horizontally because if you were to calculate those out they would actually work exactly the same this way right so it's just think x equals negative 1 and then we get um, a slope of negative 1 when y equals 1 and we get a slope of um, negative 2 when y equals 2 and so on so it's the same exact slopes, it's just flipped. So noticing patterns like that will be very helpful with differential equations because they can give you some shortcuts and stuff like that so that you're not thinking about every single one and plugging every single thing in. All right, so let's try this now. Let's guess a solution curve for initial condition negative one, one. Negative one, one is over here. So if you start there, the question is, how does the solution go? So it seems like, for one thing, it's symmetrical. So something like this is probably going to happen. And you get a parabola-looking thing. All right, how about if we have 0, 1 as our initial? Then it looks like we have a parabola still. Um, a slightly different parabola, but parabola nonetheless. I didn't have this one written on here, but let's try something else. What if we start at 0, 0? It looks like going to the right is going to make us go up like this. Going to the left is going to make us go down like this. So we have kind of a cubic little thing going on here, right? So as you can see, behavior is different depending on where you start. So let's move on and see how to actually solve these things themselves. So. Two words, separate, integrate. They rhyme. It should be easy to remember those, right? So if you can separate them, you can integrate them. In AP Calculus, you'll be able to separate any differential equation. That's the point. All right, so let's solve them. Let's separate that. Move all the y's and the x's onto different sides. Then integrate that. All right, so we get ln of y minus 2 equals x squared over 2 plus c. The plus c is important. Make sure it's there. Exponentiate with base e because that's going to cancel out ln. Then we get y minus 2 equals e to the power of x squared over 2 plus c, which is the same thing as e to the x squared over 2 times e to the c. So we're going to do a little substitution here. Let a equals e to the c. Just make it a little bit easier. You will see why later on. 
So y equals 2 plus a times e to the x squared over 2. Now let's plug in the initial condition. Plug that in here. So y is negative 2. And let's see, x is 1, so that's just 1 half. The goal now is to find a. What is that thing? So let's subtract 2 from both sides, and we get negative 4 equals a, e to the, I'm going to say square root of e, because same thing, just quicker. Then that means a equals negative 4 over square root of e. So our function is 2 minus 4 over square root of e times e to the x squared over 2. You can actually simplify this further and get y equals 2 minus 4 e to the x squared minus 1 over 2. This is probably the simplest form that you can get it into. Looks a little bit nicer than this, right? Because you don't have a square root in the denominator there. All right. Although this is probably acceptable too if you had something like this on the AP. All right, so moving on. Another thing with differential equations that you can do is called Euler's method. Euler's method gives us a way to estimate values and solutions based on the differential equation. So you're given dy dx and you're gonna be given an initial point and you're gonna be given a step size. Using those, you're gonna create a tangent line and then estimate the value at the next step. So that's x sub zero plus whatever the step size is and then that new x value is x sub one and then you use the tangent line, plug in x sub one, get a new value, that is y sub one. Do that again, get a tangent line, use those and then get another two points and then do the same thing get another two points and do that until you get to your target x so the goal is use dy dx and your initial condition and step size to get y of x sub n. x sub n is just um, whatever that target n x is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so let's look at how this actually works. So that was just a general idea of how you want to think about it. Now let's do it. So, I'm gonna take that same differential equation, work on it. I'm not gonna finish this completely just because this is insane, but um, you can continue it yourself and I'll probably post the solution in the description. So let's look at this. So slope zero, I'm just gonna call it that. That's slope using x zero, y zero. Plug that in and we get one times negative two, which is negative two. All right, let's get the tangent there. Y plus two equals, uh, let's see, negative two times X minus one. All right, if we simplify that all out, you'll see that you get Y equals negative two X. Okay, so now let's um, plug in the next point. So this tangent line is gonna help us ex estimate the next point. The next point is going to be one plus 0.1. So y of 1.1 equals, it's gonna be approximately, negative two times 1.1, which is negative 2.2. So that means x1, y1 is 1.1 comma negative 2.2 
plug that in. Slope with that is going to be 1.1 times negative, that was supposed to be a negative sign. 2.2 .2 is negative 2.42. All right. Tangent there is going to be y plus 2.2 .2 equals negative 2.42 times x minus 1.1. y equals negative 2.42 x minus, I think it was 4.682 or something like that. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just doing this kind of from memory from doing the video three or four times. I'm just trying to get through it at this point. So let's go. Um, estimating y of 1.2 if you plug this into a calculator, by the way, these problems are probably going to be calculator problems unless you're given really, really nice intervals and stuff. I didn't do that to myself here. Um, yeah, so y of 1.2, that's going to be like, I think that was negative 7.766, something like that. And then continue that until you get to y of 1.5. That's a few more steps later. That's going to get a bit crazier. You use a calculator. Yeah. Okay, so moving on then to the very last thing for this video slash was supposed to be stream is the mean value theorem. Oh, that got erased. Interesting. Okay, I'll just do it impromptu right here. Okay, so let's say that we have a function that goes, let's just say like this. There's A. There's B. And now you guys are going to see how I make my lines on here. So I'm going to get the line that connects them in terms of slopes. Okay, so let's look at this then. So what I'm gonna say is if we know this, then we can say that there's at least one point in the middle of A to B. So that's the slope, right? Between A and B. So there's gonna be some place where the tangent for the function equals that exactly. Where is that? More or less right there. So there ish. So there's at least one point in between for that. As long as the function is continuous on the close interval and differentiable on the open interval. So the mean value theorem states. Let f be continuous on the closed interval a to b and differentiable on the open interval a to b. Then there is a c on the open interval a to b. So that's just some value. This is that c right there. where f prime at that c is just a slope between f of a and f of b, between a and b right there. So you saw that visually happen. Now we have the formal statement of that. So this should make sense. Um, so let's just look at a quick example of that. So I kind of made this up earlier also. So let's just do that. So let's just say you're given a table, something like this. You'll probably see something like this somewhere. Negative uh, uh, 10 for 
three, let's say that's six. Okay. So let's just say V of T is continuous on five to 10. So that means differentiable. That means it's also differentiable on five to 10. Question is, is there a time when acceleration is 0.8 meters per second squared. So let's look from five to 10. Oh, is there a time on this interval when that happens? Okay, let's check. So V of 10 equals 10, or let's just do that thing. V of 10 minus V of five divided by 10 minus five. So just apply the MVT thing. So taking the function and just looking over that interval. So we get 10 minus six divided by 10 minus five, which is four over five, which is 0.8 meters per second squared. So that means yes, So because of that, by MVT, there is a C on five to 10, such that A of T equals 0.8 meters per second squared. So you can say that. All right, so done with this. Um, hopefully this was helpful for some of you. And yeah, good luck on finals. And you can definitely use this to prep for the AP test later on as well. Um, so thank you for watching this really long stream and yep, have a good day. See you all later.